brilliant to see so many people joining us today and can't wait. I'm absolutely thrilled with the amazing panel uh, that we have joining us today and so many more insights coming your way. All right, brilliant. Well, look, I've been so looking forward to today. We had an amazing kickoff to the series yesterday with the, the launch webinar and then the month end automation webinar. And absolutely brilliant to be uh, to be joined by you, to be joined by our speakers. A couple of housekeeping points. So we have time set aside for Q&A later in the webinar. Please do use the Q&A section in the Zoom controls to fire through any questions that you've got. The plan for today, we're going to do some brief intros. We're then going to get into the discussion, consolidated reporting with zero. Then we'll have time for Q&A and then we'll wrap things up and I will just showcase what's coming up over the subsequent webinars in the series. So by way of, of my introduction, so my name is David Tuck. I'm the co-founder and CEO at Mayday and of CFO Techstack. I'm, I'm an accountant by training, so did the first five years of my career with Deloitte, did my qualifications. I was then twice a zero using in-house finance leader of multi-entity businesses, and I've been an accounting tech entrepreneur for the last decade. So I was the, the founder of Chaser, the accounts receivable uh, app. And then for the last three years, I've been building Mayday uh, with my amazing co-founder Griff and our simply fantastic team. So at Mayday, we're for larger zero users. The majority of our customers have in-house finance teams. Our mission is to mend month end, starting with the needs of multi-entity businesses, intercompany recharge automation, cross-entity bank rec, keeping intercompany loans in balance. Our most recent review on the Zero App Store was titled Where Beautiful Accounting Software Meets Marvellous Multi-Entity Month End. Uh, and we've recently broadened out beyond multi-entity to also enable you to automate intra-entity uh, allocations between departments. Now, we, we won Zero's Emerging App Partner of the Year last year. And off the back of that, we did a, a shamelessly titled webinar, uh, May Day, What's All the Fuss About? And, and we were thrilled to be joined by Harriet um, as one of the panellists for, uh, for that webinar as well. And it was a great discussion. And off the back of it, kind of, you know, it, it really shone our eyes to the to the fact that, you know, there were broader questions that needed answering. You know, is zero still the right system for me as a, a you know as a growing multi-entity business? And if yes, how long will that be the case for? Indefinitely, or, or what will be the point um, at which I outgrow it? Now, the nature of uncertainty is that when we don't know something, it leads us to act earlier. The ERP move has been described by one of our customers as, as horrible and hectic, and not just any of our customers, the, the very same Harriet Hope who joins us uh, on the panel today. Um, and, and, you know, 58% of ERP implementations fail. So we've got this idea of what we call ER peace of mind, the peace of mind that I can continue to thrive and scale with zero with my SME uh, accounting system. But the issue is there's an absence of, of precedent. So, you know, too many businesses make the wrong decision in the absence of that precedent around what it is possible to do with Zero Plus its ecosystem. So we channeled that into our webinar series back in September, building an enterprise level system with Zero. Amazing response to that, 800 registrants, great feedback. And off the back of that, we launched CFO Tech Stack with a mission to create the resource that, that I'd wish I'd had as a multi-entity zero using finance leader, filling the content and community gap to address that unmet need, bridge that awareness gap to really demystify and show what is possible with zero plus its ecosystem, ultimately to provide that missing precedent. And that's been a weekly newsletter that we've been running for the last few months that gets amazing feedback. And, and, and this week's instalment, which goes out at lunchtime today, is actually in relation to consolidation. So uh, the, the link to CFO Techstack will go in the chat very soon. And if you haven't yet already signed up to that weekly newsletter, uh, given you're here for this webinar, I, I think you'd find that valuable. Uh, we launched the FLAC, the Finance Leader Advisory Council, as a representative body for finance leaders that are using Zero uh, as a system. And watch this space for Stacked, the equivalent of zero con for in-house finance leaders that will debut this September. Now this series, this is all about specifically being a group using zero and how you can thrive, how you can scale with it. And I just wanted to pop a couple of questions up on the screen to get a feel for who we have joining us today. So if you can answer those over the next minute or so, 
Now, this series is very much against the backdrop of how can we be useful to our target customer? It's not product marketing. It's not about how to build a best in class app stack. It's about what is possible. You know, there's a reason I'm not wearing a Mayday t-shirt for any of these webinars. It's really about writing that misconception, but equally it's not about overcorrecting and replacing one myth with another. You know, we want to bridge that gap about what it is possible to do with zero plus ecosystem, but there will be times where it is the right thing to move to an ERP. So that's the backdrop to this series. So excited to be running these six webinars to deliver those insights. And so let's just bring those survey results up on screen now, and we'll see who we've got with us today. Amazing. So the vast majority of us are already using Zero, And then, yeah, we've got a really good mix of, of groups there. Um, I can't, you know, five uh, really kind of um, large ones in terms of your number of entities. And then, yeah, some, some great groups in the two to five and, and six to ten entities. Thank you so much for that context. Really useful for us to have. So look, that's that's it by way of introduction from me. Zero, you know, by their own strapline, is about beautiful business. This series is how to be a, a, a gorgeous group. Um, and you know, what, what better segue from that into introducing uh, my fantastic panel that are joining me today uh, in the form of Harry, Harriet, and, and Ryan. Uh, so over to you, we'd love to get your introductions and thanks again for joining us. So Harriet, I'm gonna come to you first and then go to Harry, if that's okay. Yeah, perfect. Um... So hi everybody, um, I'm Harriet, I'm VP of Finance at Arbalus. Um, we're a multi-entity UK headquartered um, expert network. Um, we are disrupting the traditional expert network industry with some novel technology, um, lots of great things going on here. Um, I started my career at PwC in audit like lots of us, I think, in, in finance. Um, and then from there, found that my passion lay very much in uh, startups and scale-ups. So been around the block a bit, working with startups and scale-ups of various different sizes from seed to series C, and then settled um, at Arbalus a year and a half ago, just over a year and a half ago now. Um, I started in London and then had the wonderful opportunity to relocate to Barcelona in February last year. So I am dialing in Eurovision staff from, from sunny Barcelona today. Amazing. Thanks so much, Aaron. And I remember vividly, you know, one of your first tasks when you joined um, mm -hmm. kind of a year and a half ago was, you know, how to implement a, a best in class sort of tech stack for mm -hmm. uh, Arbalus. Is that right? Yeah, that's a good memory. That was actually one of the kind of when, um, when I was hired, one of the few priorities presented to me was yeah building out um exactly like you said like um the optimal tech stack at obelisk amazing well look that's amazing and so thrilled to have you uh, joining us once again to share those invaluable insights uh, that we're lucky to be able to call upon harry i'm going to come to come to you next hi everybody yeah so i'm harry um not first off nice to see kind of some familiar names um attendees and some new names as well which will be exciting to kind of get to know you but um so i'm harry i kind of head up the custom success team at join um and for those of you that aren't familiar with join we are a, a member of the zero ecosystem um and we essentially manage group reporting making that kind of taking the stress away from that month ahead multi-entity consolidated reporting uh lots of nice features and um kind of benefits to using join i guess we'll kind of discuss those um as we go throughout the webinar so uh, thank you amazing thanks so much harry uh and ryan over to you thanks so much for, for joining us today no thank you david uh so yeah so my name is ryan Piercy. i am an associate partner at scrum bland which is a mid-tier accountancy firm in the east of england i head up our digital transformation department which is helping uh, i guess small and medium-sized businesses transition into the cloud building pretty much a modern ERP, as I call it, around zero or, or similar systems. So very much know about, uh, I guess, this specific area and the pain points associated. I also am a host on the Digital and Accrual World podcast, which is all about bringing information of changes to systems of anyone that wants to listen. So if you aren't uh, or don't already listen to that podcast, please do sign up afterwards. And also uh, now run uh, the Digital Disruptors, which is a community of people that specialize in digital transformation and helping businesses move into the cloud. Amazing. Well, what an incredible panel we have uh, for us today. And, and, you know, to that end, let's let's dive into it. So first up, I just want to make sure we're, we're framing the, the context really clearly. So 
what do we mean by consolidation and, and, and why is it so important? So, Harriet, I'm going to come to you first for your sort of individual perspective from Arbalest. And then, uh, Ryan, I'll, I'll go over to you from a Scrut and Bland sort of cross section of clients that you have visibility of. Perfect. Um, so in terms of what we mean by consolidation, um, for us here, it's delivering um, a group view of our finances um, every month. We rarely look other than for kind of single entity and management accounts reviewing or statutory reporting on a day-to-day month-to-month basis we are interested in um the group on a consolidated basis um whether it's for forecasting and budgeting kpis reporting to the board whether that's through management accounts board reporting all of that's done at a consolidated level so it's extremely important that um that is easy um to achieve that and we can have accurate and um great consolidated reporting and information amazing so just to clarify so this is you as a so your your four entities as a as a group mm-hmm. yeah yeah when you talk when you're talking about management reporting mm-hmm. that is reporting as if you know they were one kind of consolidated yeah. entity yeah. yes there will be year end accounts to file for yeah. each of the mm-hmm. individual entities but on a day to day month on month business month on month basis what people care about are that single consolidated view yeah exactly amazing thank you so much Harry. amazing to to position things that way ryan from from your perspective what do we mean by consolidation and, and why is it so important well, let me start, I guess, on why it's important. There's more and more businesses now um, setting up, I guess, subsidiaries or, you know, a partner uh, businesses, mostly to to manage risk, you know, especially on the, uh, you know, as we went through COVID, if you want to set up like an e-commerce area to manage that risk, you might be setting up in a specific entity. And as we move or interact with Europe, there's more and more uh, entities being set up in foreign countries to help that trade. So the group structure is becoming uh, more common out there and so i guess you know the problems and changes that that come alongside that are growing as well but yeah consolidation what does that look like so you've got actual reporting but you've got forecasting budgeting as well and bringing all of those figures together uh profit and loss balance sheet forecast like cash flow forecasts um there's multiple different elements that need to come into this but not only is it just the the consolidation um but yeah it's aligning transactions between them which is probably the area that is always wrong. Um, it's, it's the intercompany accounts, and they never seem to balance. So getting those sorted as part of that consolidation process is critical. Amazing. I mean, on the intercompany accounts balancing point, not to, you know, want to jump on and take this, you know, different direction. You obviously mean for any business that's not using Mayday Balancer, um, which is very good. Okay, great. I'm glad we've got that all uh, clarified. Um, amazing. So look, let, let's move from that to, uh, you know, I don't want us to kind of, you know, blow straight past the, the the sort of point of, you know, what you can do in zero as a system, based in like a, you know, a first order output sense, but also critically what you can do in zero to enable you to make better use of, uh, of a consolidation tool like join, uh, for example. So, you know, Harriet Ryan, again, I'm going to come to you, like, what is there that's useful in zero natively when it comes to consolidation? And then on top of that, what are the things that you could and should be doing in zero to enable you to, to make best use of a tool like join? Yeah, I guess just to start, you know, zero has been set up to be very individual business focused. Um, but there are things you can do inside the system to make it easier when you need to come to consolidate. Aligning a chart of accounts is critical. So make that standardized uh, because it's so much easier to, um, uh, when you export, if you have to go down, down that route or overlay a reporting tool, it's so much easier than to to um, to design your reports and to identify any anomalies um, between the different entities. And it's the same with you know certain control accounts, um, anything where you might be doing intercompany transactions, segregating those out. It just makes it a lot easier to identify those transactions whenever you need to adjust for them, which is always part of that consolidation process. Amazing. Love it. That was true of the Enterprise series as well. And I'm a big like... I'm a chart of accounts nerd at heart. Like I love my granularity when it comes to chart of accounts. And so it's always nice to, you know, hear how much airtime chart of accounts and being really deliberate and granular about it and the the second order future benefits you get from that. Uh, amazing. <laughs> Harry, over to over to you. I was going to say a very similar thing, actually. I was uh-huh. going to talk about, um, I mean, there's a lot of things. I think 
the thing with zero that makes it so great but also becomes a limitation is kind of its simplicity and ease of use and maybe how it doesn't necessarily force you to attach a bunch of different tracking categories or whatever or keep consistent descriptions and maybe it tends it's very easy to let zero get quite messy quite quickly because it is so quick and easy to to do things and if you don't have the diligence then again it can cause problems I mean this could be things like yeah exactly making sure your GL names are consistent across the entities as far as possible so join is easy to use um it's things like thinking very hard about like how you want to um like have your data structured within zero do you want to use the tracking categories or do you want to use for example we kind of like having a very very long chart of accounts with with like different departments there and then you can then use join to consolidate them and make them neat and nice there and like not worry too much about having that long list in zero because you'll then gives you the flexibility to analyze it more granularly with a tool tool like join um other things like i don't know being diligent around like how you're describing or your descriptions you're putting on transactions again lending itself to data analysis if i don't know you want to analyze client entertainment by client or travel by traveler um and like having those behaviors set within the team so people are very diligent about you know if you're not forced to do it then make sure the descriptions are right when you're doing um transaction processing another thing we love in zero is um find and recode i would say we've done it so many times and it's so normal in a startup you're constantly changing how you think about data how you're thinking about splitting things up how you think about presenting things i would say just don't be scared of changing things or changing how you want to do things because there is that functionality there it's very easy to say oh I want to change how we're spilling up these staff costs I want to change something else um don't be don't I mean that's a big mistake to make is like sticking to the first iteration or the first way way of doing things just because you're worried that it might take a bit of effort to change what's there definitely and you've got some you've got like the, the automation of the foreign currency transactions mm -hmm. in, in zero which is great right mm -hmm. but then can can bring in some more challenges from a consolidation point of view, especially if you're not using those tools that, that connect in. And I, I, I still think the, the best thing about um, is zero is, is the app store, you know, the, mm -hmm. the flexibility that enables and the choice it enables. So zero is the starting point. It's the building out beyond that, that really gives you the power uh, as, a, as a business. And let's flow from that into the, you know, when it comes to consolidation, you know, if we start first with, you know, what are the what are the outputs you have been able to deliver? So Harriet for, you know, what you do at Arbalus and then, you know, Ryan for, for clients that you've worked with. What are the, you know, what are the sort of the, the, the standout examples of, of greatness that you've seen when it comes to what people have been able to do with uh, with consolidation? And then, Harry, I'll come to you for what you've seen across the, the joint customer base. So, yeah, Harry, if we could start with you, what are you what are you able to do in terms of consolidation uh, at, uh, at Arbalus? Um, so, yeah, like I mentioned, consolidation is super important because um, at the end of the day, people care about the consolidated numbers um, in lots of different ways. We, um, as a finance team, our ways of working are very, we kind of not get too bogged down in the month end and get that done quickly. And we really try and add like the extra value as a finance team through really great reporting um, to various different audiences um, and try and really have that kind of added insight and value add from finance. So. I guess in terms of how consolidation feeds into those things. Um, so we obviously have um, we have the kind of monthly management reporting. We have obviously the basic management accounts that are, are generated by join and we play around with the structure of those to make them look kind of clean, simple. We use join functionality to put some core metrics and KPIs in there with the calculations, like the percentages, for example. And if we have feedback about presentation, we can easily change it and report that historically as well. And then we can automate maybe other KPIs that sit on top of that in, in, a, in a file. Um, the consolidated data drives also drives things like um, our internal OKRs reporting. So we have monthly 
um, like OKRs reviews with the leadership team. Um, we support other parts of the business in calculating their OKRs, which might require some of this consolidated um, data as well, for example, on costs to so like calculate contribution margins. Um, and I guess um, other things from that board reporting, um, that's all driven off consolidated data to drive kind of graphs and things. Um, we also, a separate tool actually is quite interesting, we started using um, is for our consolidated cash flow forecasting. Um, that's been um, something we've implemented quite recently using a tool called um, Cashflow Frog. Um, it kind of sits separately to the management reporting um, in that it's more like, um, I guess more like an operational piece, like our short term, um, two months ahead cash flow. Um, we've really enjoyed using that. It's quite simple, cheap cash flow forecasting tool that pulls in um, data from zero and kind of use predict predictions um, and analytics on that to help you forecast out into the future as well. And that um, informs discussions and updates to our management team um, throughout the month. Amazing. Um, mm -hmm. There's a couple of things there I'm really excited to to kind of come mm -hmm. back to, uh, but I, I'm keen to come to Ryan and then to uh, then to Harry and then yeah we can just um, we can dive into a, a broader discussion. So yeah, Ryan, talk me through like what you've seen um, across clients them do when it when it comes to consolidation. Yeah, I mean, firstly, I love hearing about a new app. So thanks, Harry. I'm going to look at Cashflow Frog. Not come across that one before. Um, so yeah. Realistically, when we engage with a client that's, that's a group early on, they're doing most consolidation in Excel. You know, they've got these really complex spreadsheets, lots going on. Their chart of accounts is quite, you know, uh, unstructured. And what they're doing is, um, sorry, obviously as a doorbell's going, um, there is a, um, there's a lot of work that goes in manipulating that data in Excel. Um, and then we we basically, by moving into zero line in the chart of accounts, it means that we can significantly automate and reduce the amount of time they're spending. That's the big big win because it can be as simple as a click of a button to some extent once you've built all the structure out in the uh in the first case but the um i guess the other things that we identify is yeah where what kpis what granularity do they want on reporting and what empowerment do they want to bring into their team because as you've got budget holders on certain areas like for a, like from internally we've done this at scrum bland from a hr and a marketing perspective it means that you can empower those teams to take ownership because you can split out the reporting just on those individual departments. They can see how they're doing throughout the year across potentially multiple entities as, as we have at, at Scrum Bland um, and then go, OK, well, um, are we going to go over budget? It's, now we can make a strategic discussion throughout the year rather than at the end of it going, oh, God, we're going to be held to account because we've blown this budget. So there's a lot more empowerment that can go on in real time uh, consolidated reporting. Amazing. Uh, and then Harry, I'd love to bring you in on this. I mean, you obviously you, you work with a huge number of uh, of kind of zero using groups at Join. If you were to sort of generalise, where where are we? Where are they in in their sort of you know lives as a group when it comes to consolidation? When they when they first come to you at Join, and 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 where do they get to as a result of uh, of using your software? Yeah, no, so it's. It tends to be the same story. We hear the kind of same strap lines when we kind of meet with customers for the first time. It's, I'm using Excel, I'm fed up with it. Uh, we're making too many errors. All of those things that you'd expect. These really complicated Excel spreadsheets have become unwielding as they've expanded and kind of gained more, well, whether they acquire new entities into the group or whether they expand out. And it just becomes kind of unwielding basis to manage all of Excel because You've got new accounts being added currently. Um, a common one as well, language differences and uh, air, different areas as well. So we've got kind of groups that span across multiple continents, multiple languages, multiple time zones, and it makes it really difficult to manage multiple Excel spreadsheets, whether that be kind of sending a trial balance via email to the accountant that rolls up all the data at the end of the month, uh, just becomes kind of unmanageable and unscalable at that point, which is where it's really nice to have a tool that can do that for you, whether that be join or whether that be another consolidation tool. Apparently there are others available. Um, but yeah, no, so it's, that's the kind of the common thing that we get. Um, and you see the kind of the transformation of the way that people actually manage their group reporting as well. So we get people come in. Um, I'm just kind of thinking one example that came on top of my head, we had a kind of a 
a rather large IT firm, UK based only, and they kind of almost completely avoided producing those consolidated reports because it just wasn't wasn't feasible really for them with all the different processes they had in place. But now that they have joined and that they're basically had to do a little bit of work around getting their zero updated more regularly, but now they have at a glance consolidated reports literally whenever they want. So they can come in and get that live feed dashboard, which is something they would never have been able to have previously, or go and just kind of open up join, run those consolidated reports, which like Ryan said, you can build, do the initial legwork, and then they remain in your system ready to run whenever you want them, really. So there's, um, yeah, lots of different things there. Hundreds, well, actually kind of thousands of stories now from kind of happy customers um, and kind of the way they've changed their group reporting. Amazing. And I'm going to come back to, to Harry because what, what I'd love to kind of understand is, and, and I think our audience would love to understand, like, mm -hmm. You know, what are the sort of time frames that you're what are the time frames that you're working to when it comes to running this process and, and, and delivering the end output? Yeah. It um so as a target, we want everything kind of wrapped up by work day 10. So we usually aim to send out um management reporting, uh, management accounts to the board um by work day 10. Um the time frame is usually um, kind of getting prepared before month end, making sure like our spend desk and um, bank reconciliations, et cetera, are pretty clean. We keep very on top of these things anyway because of the cash flow forecasting that we mentioned. We try and keep stuff pretty up to date. Um, there'll be things like data checks over the um, revenue data or expert data we've got in our platform and that will get performed ahead of the month end. And then as soon as that hits, it's kind of into all the single entity staff like the billing, um, prepayments, accruals, etc. Um, we review, um, we do a cash flow um, re-forecast within like the first five working days and have a review with the leadership team, um, well, the founder specifically, um, to go through the assumptions on that because that's one of our priorities at the moment. And then by um, in the next few days, we'll have single entity management accounts reviews um, and then do the consolidation which is always very quick and easy now that we've got may day and join and then yeah try and have those outputs um by work day 10 we'll then have some more time to do a bit more in-depth like analysis um and reporting to um our founders we've started doing a bit of like a um like a finance review deck every month that goes into a bit more of a deep dive on like key areas like analyzing what the travel spend's looking like, what's the software spend, um, making making some suggestions or um, you know, putting out some some insights and things um from the finance team. Um again, like I mentioned, just kind of pulling us into like that value add territory instead of just reporting on the historics. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And so and and one other thing again, like drawing on you as the uh, you as the, the the original sort of provider of the horrible and hectic. Well, I know you've <laughs> used um, kind of Netsuite in a in a prior role. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that that I think is often a misconception that we see is that people think, okay, you've got ERP, we've got zero plus ecosystem, and it's a case of well, how close can zero plus the ecosystem get to what I'm able mm -hmm. to achieve from a um, from an mm -hmm. ERP perspective? And you know, there's the the benefits there around you know relative cost savings. But it was so interesting. We had Parish on the launch webinar yesterday. He's just moved his 46 entity group from Sage Intact over to Zero, and a point that he articulates really clearly that is representative of, of lots of businesses we work with. It's not, it's not just about how, you know, how close can we get to that? What is possible with ERP? It's mm -hmm. a, well, you know, I'm able to achieve a level of automation, a level of efficiency with zero plus its ecosystem mm -hmm. that I'm not um, able to achieve with the, the kind of native modules in a NetSuite, in a, um, in a Sage Intact. And, you know, I was keen to, to seize the opportunity to, to kind of, um, yeah, to, to talk with you about this, but also, you know, Harry, mm -hmm. Ryan, if you have any perspective on it, you know, when it comes to consolidation or just more broadly being a, being a group with zero. Um, but yeah, Harry, first to come to you, I'd love to get your perspective on that. Um, yeah, it's an interesting one. I think, I think we've talked about it before, whereby some people just, assume they're getting to the need for an ERP and, and, and just go for it 
um, probably convinced along the way by some sales emails from um, the various ERP providers um, that we get a lot. Um, but I think for me, it's it's much more about like the nature of your your business model um, and the kind of complexities that you're dealing with. Um, Arbalest, we're quite lucky that we um, like our we kind of work with like higher volume, lower value um invoicing to our to our clients which makes things a bit easier and like the cost structure and we're obviously we're we're a services business we don't have inventory we don't have physical like warehouses or any of that complex stuff all the the setups in our various jurisdictions are quite simple they're just office they're just people so there's nothing um too complex going on there we are also very lucky that we have um our arbalus platform um, which houses every single transaction that goes on in terms of revenue and expert costs that's internally built. And are, again, one of the great things about Xero is its ability to integrate um, not only with the um, apps that are developed by app providers, but but with your own systems as well. So I think it was last year, our tech team um, integrated our platform with Xero to automate our monthly billings and that's been like a tremendous time saver and also ensures all that accuracy we also have zero integrated with um our mass payouts provider Tapalti, which does all of our expert payments and, and automates that that's also linked with the platform and then with zero i think if you have it massively depends on the business model obviously services service-based models are a lot easier we don't have a stupid amount of offices um, and we have a tech team that has time to dedicate to to supporting finance in um in implementing these things as well. Amazing, um, mm-hmm. Ryan Harrow, I'd love to get your um your your thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Harriet's very modest. There is a lot of complexity that can happen in the service uh, <laughs> sector. And I think, you know, that's a perfect example of how you build a, a modern ERP um, by also plugging in and bespoking certain areas to enhance on how you have your individual business model. Um, yeah, the, the whole NetSuite versus zero thing, you know, NetSuite can be hugely bespoke. But, you know, you're going like hundreds of thousands of pounds a year. There's a lot of cost that needs to go out and you can build pretty much what you want. But then you're tied into a consultant that you need to work with on a regular basis because you've then um, built that down to exactly what you need. And it's very bespoke to you. The beauty with the modern ERP approach around zero is you can pick like out of the box solutions that work for you. It doesn't get to 100 percent. It gets 99 percent of your needs. But then as you know, Harriet uh, and her team have done, you can build something to 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 feed into zero or the other solutions that then you know bespoke it itself so you can do a lot more there are some restrictions you know like on any system zero if you've got large transaction volume you know that that's kind of a limitation of zero if you've got very uh, specific needs inside contacts or user segmentation you know it may be that zero is not the right fit but there are also other tools in the market but generally 90 percent, 99 percent of the time we tend to have zero at the core in anything we're recommending Amazing. Thanks so much. So we, yeah, Harry, over to you. Yeah, so we got some quite interesting feedback from um, obviously kind of on the back of the uh, the series we did previously, uh, David, with you the, about the kind of scaling with Zero, and kind of some of the people we've been with on kind of like chair sides and customer discussions were kind of expressed the idea that they um it was kind of it was always the dumb thing to move to ERP as you scaled and as you kind of um got more entities, but actually, it, like we've just there is there a definite need and can that you kind of Make the uh, kind of make use of the zero ecosystem and the kind of the comparative advantage that individual apps for your particular niche have over an ERP. Um, so yeah, kind of some interesting kind of changing of perceptions of people actually came from our last webinar series and a couple, two or three people I mentioned to us. So it's just interesting how that kind of the sea change is going on there. Yeah, absolutely right. The really like jobs to be done. Why rather than just a sort of received wisdom of well businesses like us do things like this and, you know and I think that's that, that's a product it was amazing to get Alex mm. um the the UK and EMEA uh, and now Asia MD from zero on the launch webinar earlier and it's like you know they openly acknowledge like their core route to market is through accountants and bookkeepers to the kind of you know the S of of SME you know they had their investor showcase a couple of weeks ago where it's like okay you know our co- core focus is this end of the market and you know the whole like zero website and marketing materials reflect that and so you can understand how people reach the kind of wrong conclusion of, well, 
we're, we're in the wrong place here. But that's actually not the case at all. As Alex, you know, made the point really, really kind of, you know, articulately, it's a, well, look, Zero was native from, you know, like ecosystem native from day one, we invested a huge amount in the API. It was always part of the vision that, you know, Zero could scale with businesses. And that's where the ecosystem comes in, which is, you know, why they're so sort of excited to support um, kind of initiatives like like this. And so I think there's a real, yeah, there's a real gap to kind of address there of, look, unless there's a specific reason, you know, as Ryan talks about there in terms of, you know, maybe you are in one of those like 1% minority cases where the transaction limits or the access rights mean that you need to move. It's not saying, you know, scaling with zero is a panacea, but it's really challenging you to say, you know, what is that specific reason I need to move rather than, or I sort of feel like businesses like us should be using an ERP system like right, right now. Um, fascinating. So thank you so much for, um, for for sharing those insights. We've got some great questions come through, which I'm just going to pick up on now. Um, I'm going to start with one from Isaac. So Harriet, you mentioned that you've opted for longer chart of accounts rather than using tracking categories. Is this due to less ability to manipulate reporting via tracking categories and the likes of join, et cetera? And was this a choice from the outset or did you use find and recode to split out transactions that were previously mm -hmm. coded using a tracking category mm -hmm. into uh, different general ledger accounts? Um, okay, I'll try and break it down. So um, we weren't, no, we. it wasn't so much a change, but I think we weren't using tracking categories particularly before. Um, I think my main reason for doing it was I think the second you have a tracking category there's kind of then another axis of like this matrix that's going on and then suddenly if you're dealing with multi-entity then you've got like the tracking category there and then the multi the entities and the GLs and it almost felt easier just you know and you're dealing with like two axes being the GL code and then the entity when you're then reviewing in different ways and then the other thing with tracking categories is I don't think zero like forces you to put them in necessarily, but obviously you have to put a GL in. Um, and like when you're using like that inconsistency can then be an issue if people aren't necessarily allocating like departments, et cetera. It's just another thing to remember to do and it takes more time. Um, yeah, I think for us, and also we quite like splitting out like, um, I mean, I think one of the main reasons um, which we did use the find and recode for is um maybe we did have anyway my team did that so i'll have to ask them but um <laughs> i think this main reason was the staff cost granularity like we really wanted to present staff costs by department on the face of the pnl instead of you know staff costs by salaries bonus blah, and then split it out by department because for me, that was a really valuable piece of information um, for people to have is to see, I mean, staff costs are by far the biggest cost that we have. So seeing the development like by the department over time then being able to compare um, to budget, et cetera, just on the face instead of having to then go into like a deeper layer was was um, was very helpful. Well, let, let me just jump into yeah. this, Harriet, because I think it, it, it's very much business mm. focus on what you want to get out, what you mm. need to get out from a reporting uh, nature. So say you've got um, uh, the function, so you're talking about phone costs, but you also then got departments and you've got um, locations. Depending on how you want to splice that data and report on that data might mean that it's better to go down the trading category route or it might be better to go down and just keep it all in one nominal structure. Really, you need to consult with a digital transformation specialist and or alongside an, an accountant or financial advisor to go, you know, how do we want to um, really report on our KPIs? So we do this way before we even migrate businesses into zero. So actually understanding what you want to get out of the, uh, at the far end before you migrate. You really need to think about the, the final point. Um, and yeah, the, the splicing of data is critical. They'll be able to sift, uh, I guess, out and uh, between yeah, nominal accounts tracking categories and what that delivers from a KPI perspective would determine whether you go down one route or the other. Amazing. We've got time for one more question, uh, which is, and I'd love to get all of your input on on this because you bring really rich, different perspectives. What's the what's the best way to test out um, consolidation tools to to find the right one for you, um, Harry? If I can come to you first. Yeah. Um, no. Okay. So this is a good one. I suppose it lends very much to kind of what I do day to day. I guess. Um, so as with most tools um, within Zero, there'll be a trial. So what we always say is, so we're kind of very product led. So it's kind of 
the people jump in or the kind of customer jumps in to join, use it itself. Um, I think I've like 95% of our users use it for your trial period, um, play around, find out the information, um, make that informed decision. But we always dedicate some real time to it. Um, get buy-in from your team as well. So if there's other kind of stakeholders in your business that will also be using the tool, make sure you get their buy-in early and see what they feel about it. And also if you get some quick results and some quick wins for them early doors, they'll be more infused to carry on using it with you. Because there's nothing worse than when you try and kind of bring a new bit of software to a business and no one really buys into it as much as you are or as passionate as you are about it. And then you're kind of stuck. The only one using it maybe, and then it's kind of a bit of a hard sell. Um, but then also shop around as well. So there'll be different things. There'll be different tools that have and meet your particular needs. So maybe join doesn't have the functionality that you want. Uh, shop around and kind of look at all the other tools and make that informed decision um, and, and don't rush into it. Amazing. Um, Ryan, I'd love to come to you next. Yeah, so, you know, a trial is a critical step. Uh, we think there's steps that need to be done before that. Um, so firstly, you know, speak to people. You, you get so much from just actually asking people questions. Find some people that, are, that know about these systems, you know, giant join webinars like this and, and learn, you know, what systems do and how people use them. Um, and then build out what you want to see. Don't just focus on lifting and shifting. That is not how you work with moving into a modern ERP. Look at what you're delivering from a reporting perspective. Now think about how we can change that. What would be brilliant? Do we want a visual style of reporting? Do we want a, you know, a database table style of reporting? Because that will determine actually what tool you want to kind of start exploring because certain ones are very traditional accountant, you know, very much we love data, lots of lots of data in our face. So we can just view it and kind of ingest it straight away. Others, they, they need a graph or, you know, a pie chart to be able to actually like, let that data sink in. And it very much uh, depends on the nature of the people in your team and the, the nature of data that's going to be in front of them to which tool you need to go down. Then once you've kind of identified maybe a, a couple that you need to um, uh, really delve into, definitely trial it, try and break it basically, find out what it can't do um, because there will be certain elements you think you assume that it can do, but you'll find out that it may not be able to do. It. And that may not be a game changer because by then talking to the team, talking to the likes of Harry, you can find out, okay, the tool can't do that now, but is it going to come in the future? And, you know, if it's coming down three months down the pipeline, it's still worth going with that tool because things are changing all the time in the ecosystem. And you need to find actually what's the long term partner you want to work with. Amazing. Um, thank you so much, Ryan. Harry, anything to add to that? No. Um, yeah, I would echo all of those points. I think, um, yeah, to talk to people, decide like, I mean, you can pay so much money for some of these tools. Decide like what you're really going to use it for. You better we've kind of gone down the route of um using a lot of like cheaper more basic tools and then like overlaying that with like some great skills in in google sheets to do like um the visualizations um it really depends but i would say like question who you're speaking to at the software partner and like a lot like ask about all your weird quirks and things that um you have in the business um and yeah once you you've you've decided to go for it like really commit to the implementation and just get it done instead of letting it letting it drag out uh, amazing well look that's great i'm conscious we're coming up on time so i'd love to go to our, our panel for their one sort of final top tip for for scaling with zero uh, as a group so i'll go um I'll harry i'll start with you then i'll go ryan and then i'll go um to to, to harriet to close us off so harriet uh harry your your, your top tip top tip um i think i'm kind of rehashing what we said quite a lot here over over the course of this webinar but i'll kind of um i'll conclude there yeah um make sure you've got some really kind of rigid processes in place before moving in into um consolidation get your charge for accounts aligned um because that makes everything easier it's not a necessity in these tools but it makes everything easier and it's good practice anyway isn't it um and then and then yeah just just make the most of the ecosystem see what's around and see what um what will kind of fulfill your needs and that will be my three points um when uh, you ask for one amazing right over to you yeah I, i've already said it but i think you know speak to people do your research if you're on here you're already doing that like david talked about you know the the stack conference if if that's something you can be involved in you know go to that go to the likes of those uh the digital accounting show or accountix spend time finding out what is the right approach don't just dive in and pick something and think it'll work out. There's too much choice out there. You need to find the one that will work for you. Amazing. And Harriet, final, final top tip. Grandstand mm. finish. 
Top <laughs> <No> tip. <laughs> Be diligent. Use zero. Keep it neat and tidy. Um, teach your team to do the same things. Have your processes well established. Um, don't overcomplicate things. Um, and don't be afraid to change things and change your processes if they're not working. Amazing. Brilliant. So look, thank you so much. Uh, it's been an amazing webinar today. Uh, so just to, to close things off, uh, there is uh, an exclusive discount um, available to uh, webinar registrants for join. Uh, so you'll you'll receive details of this uh, in the email that goes out with the follow-up and the recording to today's session. And then what have we got coming up? So later today, uh, we've got the spend management session with Becky from Saragossa, Asif from Cooper Parry, uh, and Chloe from Clio. Uh, and then tomorrow, we've got accounts payable with Sam from Thorne Widry, Hillary from Bridge Financials, and Tom from Lightyear. And then we close off the series uh, with the, the foreign exchange webinar with Carl from Gemflow, John from Beaver and Struthers, and James from Air Wallex. So we're at the halfway point in the series. Thank you so much for uh, coming along to, to today's webinar. A huge thank you to our panellists, to Harry, to uh, Ryan and to Harriet. And yeah, we look forward to seeing you over the rest of the series. Please do subscribe to CFO Tech Stack if you haven't already and watch this space for news coming very soon about Stacked, uh, the, the annual conference. Uh, have a great rest of the day. Thank you very much. David. See you later, everyone. Bye-bye.